this coke and this iron to be melted into the blast furnace. The moment I wish all of you could see is the moment when they cast. And that simply means they just bring the iron from the furnace. And it's still done the same way it's been done for many years. They just drilled a hole right into the side of the bottom of the furnace, which is made of clay, just about this big around. And as that drill bit broke through the furnace, these sparks flew over our heads and across the floors and off of the walls. And this molten iron came flowing out through little canals right in the floor, the brick floor that's been there since, I believe, 1903. There were men standing there with gloves on their hands right over top of these molten rivers of iron, and they would just put plates down into the trench where the iron was flowing. To get it to flow a certain way, it would drop through the floor and fill up the train cars below to be taken off to the steel shops. Whether you know it or not, everybody knows how a blast furnace works because if you've ever blown on the embers of a fire and it kicks up the heat and you see the flame rise. That's how the blast furnace works. The bottom of the furnace is lined with jets that they call tweers, and all they do is they just blast hot air through those tweers and keep the temperature warm enough to melt the iron. So as I told you also, I spent many years writing songs about things I knew and people I knew, places I've been. But when I was asked to write songs about Pittsburgh, I obviously had to do some research. So in my research, I came across a couple terms to describe the city of Pittsburgh during the industrial heyday. One was hell, hell with the lid torn off. And of course, that was a reference to the fires from the mills and the smoke that rose from those fires. Pittsburgh, of course, was known as a smoky city. You couldn't see the stars at night. Sometimes you couldn't see the sun during the daytime. And the other slogan that I heard to describe Pittsburgh, I really liked, the birthplace of an eight-hour day. And I think that has a lot to do with this pump house and where we stand today. <laughs> birthplace of an eight-hour day of honest work for decent pay with its winding rivers and its rich coal seam here we forge your American dream we mined the coal that fired the mills that poured the steel, that formed the rails in the workshop of America. I heard some folks say she looked like hell. With the lid torn off, belching fire and steel. speak of all the things she's not but you have to strike when the iron is hot we mined the coal that fired the mills that poured the steel that formed the rails in the workshop of America the workshop of America Wherever you may walk in this country today, the work of these hands ain't too far away. You'll find aluminum, steel, iron, and glass in your city skyline standing steadfast. We mined the coal that fired. 
aren't the mills that poured the steel that formed the rails in the workshop of America. The workshop of America. Each year this river, she carried 12 million tons. Now she carries mostly secrets, but it's clear where she runs through the workshop of America. The birthplace of an eight hour day. The workshop of America. Thank you so much. What a thought-provoking performance and really a history lesson all rolled into one. Um, we do have some audience questions. We want to begin with Augie Carlino, who is the president and CEO of Rivers of Steel National Heritage Area. Augie, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about this place in which we stand. Tell us about the history of it. And then you get to ask the first question for Tom. Sure, thank you. Um, well, we're, we're in the uh, pump house, which is the site of the uh, infamous battle in 1892 between the um, locked out steel workers of the Carnegie Works and um, the Pinkerton guards who were brought in here to take their jobs away. Um, this building is uh, standing because our organization and the Battle of Homestead Foundation uh, made it uh, one of our primary missions to preserve it for generations to tell the history of this uh, uh, place and the strike. Um, and the story of Homestead and the U.S. Steelworks. And so we're here today because of that. Um, Tom, I've got a question. Uh, um, you, you know, your life and your uh, career um, is a remarkable uh, journey, basically, um, that explores um, our heritage, our history, um, stories from our families and places where we worked. Um, tell us how you got started in this and um, um, what it means to you be, to be doing this as a career for your life. Well, it, it means a great deal to me, particularly the older I get, I think. And, uh, you know, my own family, they, they labored in various factories and so forth, not in the steel mills or the coal mines. Uh, but my wife's family, uh, the older they get, the World War II generation, her grandfather died at a very young age simply because he got a cut in the coal mine and never healed from it. Infection set in. And so... As I look at my own son, I want to pass that along. And I grew up in Wheeling during the time. It was really the decline of Main Street USA with the closing of factories and mills and, and all of the closing of businesses that fed that industry. And, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I just wanted to leave. It wasn't a place I was very proud of. But then I moved to Pittsburgh where things were happening for me and... I started to take songwriting very seriously, and as I did, I kept finding the same images in my songs cropping up in my writing, the mills and the rivers and the bridges. And uh, it was then, I think, that I realized just how important Wheeling was in my little hometown and where I came from and how important it was in helping me to become the person, the adult that I became. Um, a lot of what heritage areas do as a, as a program of their work um, tries to capture exactly what Tom's talking about and, um, you know, get stories from people who've lived and worked in the mills and mine, who experienced their lives in these communities, and using that as a way to rebuild communities, um, not just for tourism, but for people who live in these communities. You know, I often say our greatest export at one time was steel. Um, as our generations change and our kids grow up, our greatest export tends to be now young people, and we want to find ways to keep them here. Um, and working here, but also understand who they are and what these communities are so that that unique heritage is never lost. And, and we're happy to have a partnership with Tom Thank in that you. work. Thank you. And if I could encourage you to do anything, it would be to come, become more involved in your communities and orga organizations like Rivers of Steel, uh, organizations that are dedicated to preserving this great, rich history that we have here in western Pennsylvania. Yeah, my name's Mike Boydum. I worked 30 year, uh, 36 years at Homestead Works. 
and I was the last person to operate this pump house here. And uh, in June of 86, it closed down, and uh, as uh, structural mill was the only uh, mill working at the time, and everybody cleared out, and we were uh, closing out the pumps and that. I looked out the road, and I see nothing but cats. There must have been two dozen or three dozen cats just come out of the road, so when all the uh, noise and stuff uh, stopped, so it came, all the cats came out, and it was an <laughs> amazing story. And so another thing, too, was the hardest part was uh, shaking hands with people you know you'd never see again. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Charlie McAllister. I'm the president of the Battle of Homestead Foundation. I very much appreciate uh, the effort that's being made today to bring people here and to understand more about the pump house. Um, you saw, sang this song, The Eight Hour Day, and that is, I mean, that was in the 1880s, 1890s, the major organizing effort of all the unions. But really, uh, in steel, since this was an open hearth uh, facility, which took about eight to 10 hours for an open hearth heat. They worked the, until that heat was uh, brought out. But the real struggle for the eight hour day came in the 1919 steel strike. Because after the homestead strike, they imposed the 84 hour a week system, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and the swing shift. So you moved one week from daylight next week to night turn. And it wasn't until after the great hunky strike of 1919 when the ethnic people rose up that, and by the uh, commitment of religious people that got U.S. Steel to go to a three times eight hour shift so that you work 56 hours a week. That happened in 1924. So that, I mean, the origin of the eight hour day took a long time and then it was uh, solidified in the 1930s when the steel workers were organized and uh, got a contract. Thanks for explaining that. I appreciate it. Tom, I have a question. We've talked a lot about the importance of passing this history along. Why is it important for us to pass this history on, particularly to young people? Well, I think it's so important to have that sense of where you come from. It was something that dawned on me as I got older and how important my upbringing was and, and helped me to become the person that I am. So I think it's important to instill in children and young people, some of them, you know, they're, the connection to the Pittsburgh steel industry is just the name of the Steelers, the football team alone. And they really no, need to know that the people that came before us, and oftentimes their grandparents or their great-grandparents. These are people that came from overseas and settled here and worked in terrible conditions at dangerous jobs and dirty jobs and built this country that we get to enjoy today. And it's, I think it's important for children to, to realize where they come from. Well, thank you, Tom, and many thanks to our audience for not only asking some great questions but also sharing some wonderful stories that really bring home the importance of this history and many people who remember it well even now. So we're about to hear more from Tom Briding uh, to tell us a little bit more about the struggle of the miners in West Virginia. So please join me again as we welcome back Tom Briding. Thank you. Over a hundred years ago, it wasn't uncommon for children as young as nine, 10, or 11 years old to go and work at the coal mine. And the most common job for a child who was too young to walk down into the mine, some, there were different jobs, some were as simple as opening and closing the doors of the mine. But the most common job was to sit in what they called the screen room and separate the slate from the coal. Slate comes out of the ground with the coal. And sometimes for 10 hours a day, these young children would sit on hard wooden benches as the coal either passed in front of them or below them, and with their bare hands, reach down and separate slate from coal all day. And they would work alongside men who were too old to descend the mines. And when I say too old, I'm talking about men who were my age at that time, who lived in the coal mines, so their health suffered, people in their 40s. I read a great article by Stephen Crane. It was published in McClure's Magazine in 1894. It's called In the Depths of a Coal Mine. And in the article,